every company has a different audit universe. So there's a supervised and an unsupervised component to understanding the documents. And that allows us to plug into the existing flow of auditors. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about the technology. What is the secret source that is inside this product to basically, let's repeat it once more. It helps auditor, internal auditors to read very long documents, spot information that can be analyzed by human beings and can be it can determine basically whether or not there is a risk to make losses something that goes wrong or if everything is going, is is okay right now yeah so let's let's dive a little bit deeper into the technology uh, to give you a sense of like what's under the hood we're using supervised learning to classify statements in the context of their paragraphs that's one so you have a, a sentence and then you put a label in named entity recognition we're using iob format to extract entities like Canada, bank, child, children, uh, insurance. So these are each entities that have relationships with each other. And so you have like an entity relationship map. So the, besides for the supervised learning part, which is like learning to apply a label to a thing like a document or a sentence, there's also unsupervised learning, which I discussed earlier. And the concept there is that you take in a large set of documents to learn word representations that are good that are predictive. So there's a supervised and an unsupervised component to understanding the documents. And that allows us to plug into the existing flow of auditors. So rather than saying, oh, we have magic AI, we're gonna make up a new process for how to do audit. Instead, we took subject matter experts from audit and said, show us your process flow. And we align things along that process flow. So. For example, there's these what's called ERM, Enterprise Risk Management Frameworks, and we use our labeling to apply to that framework to do like an auditor does. So rather than replacing the auditor, we're helping them to apply those labels to build their risk and control matrix. And in doing so, they can find stuff they wouldn't find. For example, outliers or repeated risks or repeated controls where you say, like we talked about earlier, every year the same thing is happening. It's hard to notice as a human, but computers are good at picking up on repeated the same thing in the same department. You also have a way of doing a gap analysis of saying, wow, the R&D department doesn't say any risk and controls. They give in a big report every year, but it doesn't have anything in it. It's just empty. In other words, filler. And that allows the auditors to say, wait, what if there really is a problem here? Uh, so yeah, there, there are quite a few different machine learning technologies taped together to do that process that we just discussed. So when a customer comes to you, is there a phase where, you know, you, you need to customize either the intelligence or the way that the intelligence it, it gets integrated in their, in their processes? Yep. So the short answer is yes. Every company has a different audit universe. This is an entity defined in the audit space. And the audit universe is the segments of your company. It's like a, looks like an org chart and it breaks down the pieces of the company and what reports to what. So the documents have to be mapped into that tree that's different for each company. Maybe in a large organization, each major unit has its own accounts receivable and accounts payable. Or maybe in another organization, it's all centralized, one central AR and AP. So we don't know that. We need to work with the customer to define that audit universe. It's like a JSON object that defines their company so that we can direct the AI to put things in the right buckets and to see the right information over time. So that's an example of a customization that's part of the install process. What are the things that people need to understand the product quickly and then leverage the product and also help you to improve it so that the intelligence inside the product can grow over time and become more helpful for that person? So the user experience design has evolved a lot since our initial prototype. I would encourage developers to think about the process flow rather than like the design of the screens. And as long as you're following the flow that users already accept, they're going to put up less resistance to the new system. As soon as you go like, I'm going to create a brand new user flow because it fits my algorithm better, users are going to be a little bit confused because they trained from university until deep into adulthood to do things a certain way. The less you mess with that a certain way, 
Like imagine if you said, I'm going to make a new car, but the steering wheel is on the roof instead of in front of the user. They're going to be super annoyed. So what you want to do in the interface design is try and be as simple and also as non-disruptive as possible, but still add in as much like fancy capabilities. So there's a trade-off there. Like I, as a machine learning developer, would love to put in all sorts of bells and whistles that the subject matter experts have said back to me, I don't get it. It's like a very fancy picture, bright colors, but I don't, I don't get it. So for example, a correlation map. I think correlation maps are a very interesting tool and useful, but auditors look at this bright blob and they're like, okay. Or the common thing in word embedding is to graph in 3D the words and their relationships to each other. But auditors don't think like that. They're like, I mean, pretty, but like, how does this help me? So yeah, the, the, the user interface design has to demonstrate utility, not just fanciness. How you get information from the users that you can use to improve your algorithms? Does your solution need to get better in time? And if the answer is yes, how do you incentivize users to give you that information? That's what the system does. It has a relabeling interface so that if the system made a mistake during an engagement, for example, let's say it said this statement is a certain kind of risk, but it was the wrong kind of risk. The auditor, as part of the task they're trying to do, will be doing the relabeling kind of for free. They're, they're relabeling it by saying like, no, no, it's this, and then grabbing it and putting it into their workflow. Now, the system learns from that, but we do the retraining like on a quarterly basis, not live. That would be way too dangerous. So the reason is we want to go through a quality assurance flow to make sure that the model is not messing up and also to make sure that it retrains on lots of data, not just on like one new sample. But yes, it does get better over time by taking into context more labeling at the client site about their specific business. But also we deploy new versions of the model from our labeling that we do so that they're continuously getting newer versions of the product. So you're saying basically that you retrain these algorithms every quarter. What are the requirements for this retraining to be effective? So it's actually a very quantitative process. Um, we look at, for example, uh, in the risk and control model, where we're saying like, is the sentence a risk or a control or other? What we do is we measure the F1 score, which is like the harmonic mean of the uh, recall and the precision across data that the system has not seen. That's a very, very strong validation that the system is working because it's doing inference on data it never saw. Now, what we need to remember is that the incumbent technology is humans, unassisted, and they make lots of mistakes. So they do sampling. They literally like take a big chunk of the reports and then don't read them at all. The important thing is that the process is continuous improvement. I'll never be satisfied and say like, yeah, we don't need more data. We always need more data, but there is diminishing returns. So what we've observed is that when you're at about 85% accuracy on whatever model, getting each percent more takes more and more and more effort. 